legend football. Is there anyone better than this man? Only Buddy could do something like that at this particular time. He has done, he has done the impossible. 13, 13! Can you believe it? And he really would be worth all the money they're paying him. Oh. Give him a longer contract. What a kick. Franklin sizes them up from 48. Through one, past another, with some style. It's skills like that can make a grown man cry. But he's still going. But he's still no. going. He's unstoppable. <laughs> this is Buddy Franklin. <laughs> this is the greatest showman. Franklin's kick six. This to put the Hawks in front with just a few seconds left in the elimination <laughs> final. Lance Franklin. Oh, what an inspiration. It's a one-man back one. He's away, running now towards the 50. Can he do it again? Man running back towards the goal square. Needs to be closer. He can't bounce it through. He kicks it through on the ball. This really is a bittersweet moment for me because as long as I've been watching footy, I've been watching Buddy. 2005 was the first season I can properly remember sitting on my couch and watching Hawthorne games at the time, given that they were my childhood team and that has continued through adulthood. And Buddy has been the linchpin of that. My formative years as a footy fan was watching him light up nearly every stadium and nearly every team for nine years before we'll talk about one of the most crazy deals of all time and watching a legend just continue to grow throughout his career at the Swans. Now, I've seen a lot of people on social media describe Buddy as a Hawthorne player. They see him more as a Hawthorne player and considering that's where he won his flags and kicked about 90 extra goals, I don't really blame people at all. Even though I am a Hawthorne fan, I do still see Bud as a Hawk and a Swan. It's very hard for me to pick one particular side, considering that I was 15 years old when Buddy did take off. And of course, that was after a grand final, and I actually really couldn't blame him even back then. But something that needs to be said is Buddy's legacy, and there's going to be more about that at the end of this video, is that he was an absolute champion of the game, whether you loved him or hated him, and you had plenty of opportunities for both, depending on what type of fan you are, but the longer that we see Buddy in retirement, I believe the longer his legend will grow as a man who is that big, that strong, and that big of a kick, unleashed an athletic ability on the AFL that has not been matched before, currently or since and I'm not sure it's going to be matched in the future either a genuine freak so let's go down memory lane with bud before I get into the proper nerd stuff now that 05 06 that I spoke about really were the epitome of untapped potential and we've seen it even with key forwards now a couple of years in you're looking about that goal a goal and a half per game and hopefully to take the next step and if there ever was a blueprint on how to take that next step. 2007 and Bud were the perfect ones. Over 70 goals with one of his last ones being that winner against Adelaide that we've all seen a million times and just continues to grow and grow. What an inspiration he was and the way that he turns to the crowd and goes absolutely nuts is fantastic. I was very lucky to interview Rick Ladson a couple of years ago and I asked him as the man who did kick it to Bud on that day and apart from wanting a bit more of the collective credit and I love that from Lado, what a great man that he was he claims that even though that game was at Marvel Stadium that that crowd was nearly as loud as anything he'd experienced and considering what was to come about 13 months later that is all the more extraordinary so coming off a 70 plus goal season clearly Bud was ready to take over the AFL. But again, we've seen so many times, especially in this modern era, where guys can have that one-year wonder and we can argue, debate, or try to dictate where a loss of form has come from. But that wouldn't be it for Bud. Now, I know if you're watching this as a Richmond fan, you're going to be upset by what I'm going to say, but I would take Buddy's 2008 season 
over Dusty's in 2017. Now, both of them did things that are exceedingly rare. Dusty won everything, Blag and Norm Smith medal included, and I'm not going to go down the path of the legitimacy of that Norm Smith because this isn't about Dusty, it's about Bud. Over 100 goals, and to do it in the home and away season as well, yes, the last game, I think goes a little bit underrated here, especially because Buddy now owns the second highest goal total in VFL, AFL history of goals in a season but not kicking 10 plus in any game. So it's not like a seventh or an eighth of his goals came from a 16 goal bonanza, although they were really fun to watch for those footy fans in the 80s and 90s. I wouldn't know because Bud's 13 is still the highest I've seen in a game. I know that plenty of you, especially of an older generation, have seen plenty of that have equaled those and more, and I have not, so I can't really comment on that. But no one has really come close. No one's kicked 90 since, let alone coming close to Bud's 113 for the season, including that qualifying final massacre of Dale Morris and Brian Lake, including Bruce McAvaney calling him the Usain Bolt of football. Now, the weird thing about that is that Bruce was actually spot on with comparing Buddy with a genetic freak. It's just not Usain Bolt that I'll compare him to. But more on that a little bit later. 60 plus goals in each of the 09 and 10 seasons, although the Hawks weren't producing the results that were befitting of a grand final victory. And although Bud did kick two pretty important goals at similar spots on the ground too, albeit at different ends, I think Matty Scarlett's performance on him goes under the radar. 111 goals to that point. Scarlo did a magnificent job on him as Mark Williams and Stewie Dew in the front half erect Geelong's hopes of back-to-back -back premierships. And as we saw in 09, potentially back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. But overall, that is still the greatest day as a Hawks fan for me and the grand final that I've watched the most, even though 89 and 2014 are neck and neck there. I've got the old 89 DVD and I love it a lot. 2011 and 2012 might be remembered for two moments or a game in a moment, if you will. 2011, even though Bud had kicked over 80 in a really good return to form, that goal against the Pies in the preliminary final was bound to go down in footy folklore as not only one of the better goals of all time, but one of the more iconic finals moments. Until bloody Luke Ball, who up to that point was might have been in my top five of favourite non-Hawks players of all time, and he just simply can't fit in that category anymore. And yes, I'm still salty about it 12 years later. Sue me, doesn't bother me at all, but... The way that he turned Tarrant inside out, got onto that left foot, six foot six, at that pace to get that level of ball control, it's extraordinary. And one of the more extraordinary things about Bud, I think he's summed up in these moments, is that the more difficult something was seen, the more we expected him to do it, and the more he did it. Sure, he was not the most accurate set shot kick, but Hawthorne fans weren't degrading Bud for missing from 55 out and burning teammates. It was that 30 to 35 metres out where he'd get that hook, not bring the ball back because of distance, and that could lead to some frustration. Rightly so at times, yes, but once that 113 goal season came in, I think especially of my generation, we expected Bud to be perfect all the time, nearly every game, he had to will us over the line and become a one-man forward line. Even though, of course, he and Jared Ruffhead kicked basically 200 goals between them in that 08 season. Ruff as the perfect number two and one of the better number two single season performances I think we've had in a long, long time. But moving on from 2011-2012, saw Bud kick 13 against North Melbourne, especially remembered fondly by me as one of my favourite people who's a North Melbourne supporter. And she messaged me on Facebook at the time saying, Hawthorne were going terribly. I thought we were unbeatable in Tassie and things were not looking that great. It was still pretty close at quarter time, but the Roos were putting up a fight. And then an hour and a half later, we'd wipe the floor with them and Hutto had delivered one of the better commentary lines of all time, which was extraordinary considering his commentary for Buddy's 12th goal was incredible as well. Sometimes you just need to sit back 
and enjoy the show. Something that Hawthorne fans were able to do unbelievably well throughout the first part of his career. And then in 2013, all the talk, whether it was national sports media, fans, even high school as a 15-year-old myself, being where would Bud play on? Would Bud stay at Hawthorne? And there were even people asking whether he was worth the million bucks, which, yes, I know, a decade ago, very different economic nature of AFL football. I understand that in a big, big way, so don't think I'm stretching that a little. But in hindsight, it is a little bit silly and something that invokes maybe a smirk rather than stupidity, in my opinion. But in 2013, Bud was deployed as a half-forward flanker almost at times. Reminds me a bit of what I think Jeremy Cameron would be absolutely suited for if Geelong could afford another tall forward. However, Jezza as a centre-half forward is a star, but I don't want to make this about someone who's not Bud, but Bud's ability to move up the ground, move back, and use that elite field kick, which is what he had, which made some of his goal kicking even more questionable and even more hair was being ripped out by particular Hawthorne fans. But that 2013 season, it was redemption after the disaster of 2012, a game that Bud got a lot of heat for, even though throughout the last two finals, yes, he did kick six goals, nine, and he was still inaccurate. I feel Bud, as the superstar, was made out to be a scapegoat a little in that 10-point loss, especially considering the Hawks had kicked 11 goals, 15. However, he had some inaccurate teammates on the day that escaped the ire, and in my opinion, I have no credibility on this at all, but... I believe that the downfall of 2012 did make Bud sit up and take notice that maybe the Melbourne media spotlight mightn't have been for him. And that 2013 season, of course, was capped off with a premiership for the Hawks, the one they should have won in 2012. And don't worry, plenty of folks were tipping Freo to win in 2013. Bud did get that 50 metre penalty when Luke McFarlane went over the mark, but Again, McFarlane did a fantastic job on him in the grand final. It wasn't Bud's role to try and kick a six and win the game. Gunners kicked four. The rest of the forward line worked beautifully. And although it is one of the uglier grand finals of modern times, when you're on the winning side, no one really gives a damn. And then as soon as the siren went, there was happiness. There was joy. It was the epitome of excellence for the Hawks. But a countdown clock had begun before Bud was set to join the newest AFL franchise, Greater Western Sydney. Until, seemingly, we all woke up and we were all treated to the greatest magic trick the AFL had ever seen. Bud was joining the Swans. Clearly one of the uh, uh, biggest signings the club's had. Um, Lance is one of the greatest players to play our game, so... Nine years, 10 mil, seemed crazy, but who would have thought that after that nine-year deal, he would actually sign another contract, which just shows how ridiculously good and athletic and healthy that Bud's been able to be throughout the entirety of his career. 2014 rocks up, and the two-time Coleman medalist in 08 and 11 continued his one every three years streak in 2014 by taking out the Coleman medal for his new side, combining with Kurt Tippett in order to bring a flag back to the Swannies, which would have been worth 10 times what they were paying him throughout the entirety of his contract. It would have been crazy the way the media were going nuts for it. But the Hawks, in a way, there has not been a season where the reigning premiers have been more of a sleeping giant than the Hawks in 2014. Bud was gone. Could the Hawks adapt? But no, the Hawks got through that preliminary final against Port Adelaide. I still remember I was working as a first-year apprentice in the kitchen at the time, and I snuck away to the bathroom once service had stopped, and I caught the last 45 seconds uh, in the restaurant upstairs staff bathroom. And that was honestly one of the craziest nights for reasons I don't need to go into in this video. But what a crazy finish it was. Again, breaking the hearts of another South Australian fan base. But it turns out that once that preliminary final hurdle was overcome, nothing was going to stop us. The rough head hit on Hanabry was insane. The way that Mitchell, Lewis, Burgoyne, and pretty much every Hawk on the day played. The fairy tale of Matt Spanger was fantastic. 
But Bud was probably Sydney's best player. He and Nick Malczewski both played very well on the day. Bud kicked a few, led up the ground really nicely, and on a day where his midfield gave them genuinely nothing in terms of both clearances and kicking efficiency, I think Bud's a bit hard done by when it comes to this game. Yep, the Swans got smacked. I understand that. But Bud was very, very good. A Coleman medal, a grand final appearance. It seemed as though that elusive flag would be coming for Bud and the Swans very soon. Kicked 81 again in 2016. Did get hurt in the grand final, but it was after that grand final game against the Western Bulldogs that I think a lot of commentators and fans alike were questioning Bud's record in finals. And if you do take a look at his record in finals here, you could say that the eight against the Bulldogs do inflate those numbers a little bit, but I do think that it is a bit unfair. This is a guy that we are talking about walking away from the game with 1,066 goals here, which is crazy. Finals football, everything becomes more and more difficult with, of course, Gary Lyon being the last player to kick 10 plus in a final. So eight is extraordinary. And there are games, albeit non-grand finals, where Bud was clearly the best player. However, the Bulldogs broke their drought. Bud copped a little bit of criticism from the Melbourne media, but that move seemed justified because when Bud was made out to be a little bit of a scapegoat during that game, whilst fans were blaming umpires, media were looking at Bud and the senior Sydney players at the time. It didn't really happen in New South Wales all that much. And the decision to go to the Swans effectively to do as much hiding as Buddy could, it seemed like the right call. But they still hadn't won that flag. And as we fast forward through towards the end of his career, Buddy did not go out with a whimper. Yes, that game against the Bombers, he did come off with that calf injury. And we're not sure how many more games he's going to get before he hangs the boots up. But in his second and third last seasons, he kicked 50-plus. This is a man that was in form. Was he the same, bud? No. Was he still better than the other tall forwards Sydney had? Oh, yeah. Was he still in the upper echelon of full forwards, centre forwards in the game? Please. Of course he was. It's buddy we're talking about. He went and won the Coleman in 2017 again, continuing his three-year per Coleman that was spoken in 2020 and 2023. But he's four, one every three years, kind of a cool numerology thing there, but it dominated again, bud, in that 2017 season. And then in 2018, Optus Stadium was unveiled, Sydney versus West Coast. Luke Parker kicked a miraculous goal over his head and bud kicked eight. Because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you at that point in time? But I think we need to understand that Bud getting through that nine-year contract and still playing on is extraordinary. No one saw that coming. It would have been a 1,000 to 1 when that deal was signed. But one of the bigger questions is, was it worth it considering the Swans didn't win a flag? Now, I believe that it was worth it for the Swans, because one player winning you a flag doesn't fly. Look at the grand final where Bud played best in for the Hawks. 2012. Kicked two in 08. Kicked one in 13. Kicked three goals five in 2012. Hawthorne lost. Takes more than one man to get this done. When a fully functioning forward line is in effect, great things can happen on grand final day. Now, did Buddy and Tippett take too much up of the salary cap? in that 14 period, maybe, but I don't begrudge clubs for having a go, it's like Melbourne with Brodie Grundy, they had a ping, I'd much rather clubs do that and recognise if they get it wrong, than never do it in the first place, but one of my favourite moments of all time, watching AFL footy, was when Bud did this, but not least, what do I think Bud's legacy is going to be, now I said earlier that Bruce McAvaney described Bud, as the Usain Bolt of football, and I said that there is another global superstar that I think we can compare Buddy to fairly, and that is LeBron James. Now, if you're not an NBA fan, I'm going to catch you up as neutrally as I can. Now, LeBron, I know most of you know who LeBron is. I know all of you pretty much know who LeBron is, but 
as good as LeBron is, he's the highest point scorer of all time. One of the best athletes we've ever seen. And I don't have the words, the superlatives right now to describe how great he is. At worst, he's the second greatest player of all time. And there is a huge divide amongst basketball fans, whether it's him or Michael Jordan. I'm not appeasing that argument today. But as good as LeBron is, and as good as Buddy is, and as great as they'll both be when they retire from sport, any and all detractors are going to point to a poor grand final record. Of course, for LeBron, an NBA finals record. LeBron is 4-6 and six after going to 10 finals. Buddy's 2-4. and four in grand finals and that is going to be how people are going to tear down bud in footy debates in media grabs and all these things now is that fair on both of them i would argue a little but not nearly as much as it's blown out we need to be ultra grateful that we've been able to see one of the best footy specimen of all time this man in modern times kicked over a thousand goals the next highest amongst current players haven't hit 800 yet, and one of them, Jack Rewalt, will probably retire at the end of the year. And Tomahawk ain't getting anywhere near him, even if he kicked 80 goals a year for four years. He's not playing four more years. He's not kicking 80 goals per season. This is a genuine freak, a human highlight reel, and a man that brought men, women, and children of two states of two cities to the footy and made it so entertaining to watch him. We're seeing Barbie and Oppenheimer right now, but for a footy nuffy like me, Bud was pure box office. Now, considering he's the kind of man that didn't go to a media conference, there is no way in hell he's ever going to watch this. But on behalf, I think, of most rational footy fans, Bud, thank you. Thank you for an incredible career. Thank you for everything that you did for my Hawks and for plenty of people's swans. Thank you for being a reason that opposition clubs hated you because you were so good. Thank you for being a superstar. Thank you for being an absolute AFL legend. Good luck for whatever comes next. And I cannot believe that I've been lucky enough to essentially grow up and have my footy fandom bookended at this moment by such a champion what do you think of bud comment below let me know like this video if you like this video share it with a footy loving mate or a big buddy fan thank you so much for watching enjoy your weekend enjoy round 21 i can't wait to see what it brings i might start posting my tips i know that it's uh, a little late in the season but i might do that in the community tab and you guys can rip me apart because sometimes my tipping is excellent and sometimes it's terrible. I am a 3-4 kind of operator or I'm a 7-8-9 kind of operator. I'm very rarely a 5 or 6. So we'll see how it goes. I'm getting out of here. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Goodbye. We're a happy team at home.